welcome all of you to this very interesting topic. Uh, this is our webinar number three in the series. We're bringing together business leaders to discuss how high tech is defining the future of geopolitical competition. I'm sure you're reading a lot about it nowadays. Uh, prospects of economic growth recovery, which you can say has been led by high tech and how businesses itself evolve in this post pandemic world. A lot of things have been thrown at us that we'll have to look at. Now today's topic is IoT. Uh, it's been very dear to me for a very long time, and I am very excited to see that how this topic has evolved from a technological issue to a strategic issue. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of welcoming some very great experts who are thinkers and disruptors in IoT, and they'll be sharing their views with you today. A little bit logistics, uh, quite a few of you have submitted some questions to us. We will address them too in the Q&A section and during the conversation too. But if you have questions for our panelists, please post them in the chat window and we'll address them along the way. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce my partner and colleague, Vidisha Suman, who herself is a pioneer in the IoT space. Apart from that, she founded Women in Digital. She's very passionate about that, where she mentors and grows and coaches women to take on leadership roles, not only in the IoT space, but also in the digital space. So with this, I'm going to pass it over to Vidisha and one more time say welcome everyone thanks a lot Bharat. and again welcome everyone very excited to moderate the discussion today on an uh, interesting talk of iot joining me today are our three panelists i'll start with the first panelist terry lewis she is a director and founder at planet connected she and i share a common passion of an engineer by training and a technologist by heart and she's pretty much literally on the road right now. You can see her in the car. Um, Terry has uh, with her, and she's bringing with her a multidisciplinary and a multicultural background. She has worked uh, extensively at Caterpillar, where she deployed IoT and artificial intelligence for Caterpillar's power generation business. Terry, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm the second panelist. Thanks, Terry. Second panelist, Brad Sirak, is the Chief Product Officer at Turntide Technologies. He brings with him 25 years of experience in system integration, enterprise software, and the industrial space, having worked across SAP, GE, and Hitachi. Uh, having known Brad for a while now, one thing I can say about him is that he is a pragmatist. So I'm looking forward, Brad, to your pragmatic views on how we can think of IoT and connected technology to deliver greater business value. Welcome again, Brad. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Vidisha. Thanks, Brad. Guneet and I, I think we've known each other for a while now, and we have had several conversations on the outcome-based as-a-service business model that's being enabled through IoT. Guneet serves on Relay's management team as a senior vice president, and he leads their America's operations. He has also worked in the enterprise software, IoT, and networking space with companies like Cisco, Oracle, and Telelogic. And uh, in his spare time, he mentors early stage startups. Guneet, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Absolutely delighted to be here. All right. So the topic of IoT is very dear to all of us who've joined today and I'm sure to all the audience as well who's listening in. Uh, every time I hear or speak about Internet of Things, or in particular, industrial Internet of Things, uh, we hear about the explosive growth we've seen from 1.6 billion in 2018 to almost expected to be 12 billion in the next two years. A lot of that growth is attributed to advancements in technology. So on the one hand, uh, technology has allowed a reduction or decrease in price of smart sensors. The price has dropped by almost 7% since 2008 and is expected to drop to uh, maybe around 10% in the next two years. And coupled with that, you have advancements in 5G, cloud, edge, and now quantum computing. All of these technologies, what has helped with that is one, collection and storage of vast amount of data from connected devices. Two is uh, more analytics at the edge and real-time processing, eventually leading to faster and automated decision-making. And like Bharat alluded to earlier, IoT is no longer just a technology option. It is a strategy that empowers new business models. Uh, I'm going to start the panel today with a question to all three of you. 
Is advancement in the underlying technology the only driving force behind growing IoT investments? Terry, let's start with you. I think um, it's it's really interesting to see how IoT, especially in the industrial space, has accelerated. Um, I think starting point had to be people getting comfortable in the consumer uh, market and using technology. And as as consumers, we've gotten um, used to our phone. It's it's often been called as the uh, the on road or the internet or the highway. It's been translating over into uh, the industrial space, and that's really been an accelerator. Um, and that and I think that's just going to as we start getting connected with our health devices and our homes and everything else, that's just going to cascade through our expectations in industry. So uh, it's it's we're really you know. We're excel we continue to accelerate in deployment of IoT and industry. Do you also see a shift in consumer demand driven by the connectedness that's enabled through technology? In the industrial space? Yes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. You know, early on we were looking at um, uh, what industry when we were developing uh, when I was at Caterpillar, we were developing our digital strategy. We we're looking at adoption. And we segmented the, you know, the markets by, you know, construction, uh, utilities, heavy construction, mining, and really couldn't come back and understand the data until we came back and started looking at the basics of whether the customers had a smartphone or not. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the industry, whether somebody was was used to using a smartphone was a driver in adoption in all of our industries, which was a fascinating outcome of the of the research. And something we didn't expect at all, and I just see that play out over the last ten years, and just more and more. Brad, the, what the, about you? Sorry, yeah. Terry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say the only downside to that is maybe is or difference is industry's been more uh, concerned about data privacy and security because it it adds you know business risk, whereas on the consumer market it hasn't been as big of a deal, people are not as much as industry. So maybe that's where industry being more nervous that cascade and drive some positive benefits back to consumers. Thanks, Terry. Brad, over to you. Yeah, I think I think what I get so excited about working in this space is the fact that it's not just about the technology, but it's almost equal parts technology and and business model innovation. I think the technology advancement um, opens up new competitive strategies for companies in different areas. It also drives new collaborations. I think I've, you know, I've really been, um, and Terry, I'm sure, focuses in this area too. I've, I've been fascinated by this convergence of what was traditional operations technology and information technology and how it creates this whole new set of dynamics inside of um, engineering-led companies to to think about how these technologies, you know, open up new capability sets, but then oftentimes those allow uh, these companies to to transform their business models, which I know is where Ganit, you know, lives in that whole world. And so for me, it's fascinating because it's not all about technology. It's not all about business model transformation. It's really almost equal parts, and they they constantly are. Are leapfrogging each other, and that's what's I think keeps the space dynamic and interesting. Brad, I'd, I'd you like to add. Uh, go ahead. Really. <laughs> no, go ahead. This is the fun of the virtual world, at least in person. When I was in Terry <laughs> last time, I could look at her and say, "Terry, I'm speaking." But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think a couple of things to add to Brad, what you said is it's absolutely a fascinating combination of business and technology. But also, I think in addition to that, a lot of the industrial world has realized that they can get into a predictable and a resilient uh, revenue source. And you know, I was telling you know, and uh, Brian, you you've experienced it. You know, I was with Cisco. Sixty percent of Cisco's revenue comes from recurring revenue, and not the networking equipment today. It's a public fact, which is very very fascinating, right? The technology world has gone through this, but the industrial world has not. And they think the combination of IoT tech and business models can get them there, which is very interesting. And I think the second thing is the risk part. And Terry, you said it really well. Cyber risk is one of the biggest things which industrial companies think about. Uh, in Munich Re, not a wheeler, but an apparent company, cyber risk is the largest growing insurance portfolio today. Everybody wants to you know, manage the risk of cyber or manage the risk of threats. And 
So I think that's a fascinating mix of business models, technology, but people have seen the, or industrial have seen the light of uh, resilient revenue streams and also some examples of managing risks. We're not there yet, but I think we're getting to a point that we're thinking and managing risk, which I think is a, is a great time. Yeah. Yeah, and Guneet, we've spoken a lot about this uh, as a service business model and the managing of outcomes. So you start selling and engaging your customers uh, to pay for and receive outcome versus a product. So what is that mindset shift that's needed to think about this new business model? Yeah, I'll go first and I'd love to get um, the, you know, Brad and Terry's perspective. I think the first mindset change is where is the value? Because, you know, all of this we're talking about, uh, you know, from an IoT perspective, from a, you know, equipment perspective. Um, traditionally, industrial equipment is very inefficiently run. And the idea is how do you drive value and where do you drive value? You know, for example, we talk about equipment as a service, right? We talk about don't sell equipment, but we'll enable a model of pay per use, be it motors, pumps, construction equipment. Of course, that means more revenue for the OEM. And of course, it works more revenue and predictable revenue for the OEM. But, you know, lots of studies done show 50, up to 15% reduction in total cost of ownership. So in my so, mind, till then there's value both places. Then it's a question of capturing that value and who captures that value. And I see um, a lot of people thinking about this. You know, of course, Tesla started this and a lot of, you know, Apple started this with the whole vertical integration. You know, let me go all the way to the consumer and capture all this value as much as I can. And I see a lot more, let me get Brad and Terry's perspective, I see a lot more conversations around value than before. Yeah, and Terry, is there uh, maybe a few particular use cases where you see maximum value creation from this new? I think you need to hit on it was what, what I've seen across multiple industry segments is uh, capital, util you know, utilization of capital investments, right, of industrial machinery, um, you know, where IoT has just driven some key basics that you, you just kind of think, wow, what, why do we miss this? Is just location. If, if you got mobile equipment, just knowing where it's at is a huge benefit. You look at some of the, the big, you know, rental companies that are renting and construction equipment, you know, just knowing where the, that, you know, that concrete pump is at is just huge. And it's, it ends up being a pretty big uh, loss statement on their, on their balance sheet. So just hours and location has just been a, a game changer in a lot of businesses. Um, just knowing if it's running or if it's sitting idle, I think consistently, I think you you mentioned this is, you know, I've seen anywhere from 15 to 30% improvement of the capital assets just by knowing where they're at and if they're running, if they're not running, and then being able to, to move those around and optimize them. So that's been a really exciting part of the, the business and the value proposition for people in, in space. Brad, you've, you've also worked with a lot of industrial powerhouses. How do you have that conversation around moving from selling a product to selling value or outcome? Hmm. Well, I think, uh, I, I think it all comes down to the P&L, you know, and in the bottom line. It, when I was a GE, uh, wow, it's been a while ago now, 2011. Can it be that long ago? Um, it was really all about uh, how do you drive 2% margin on $47 billion of managed maintenance services. That was the mission that eventually became GE Digital. It wasn't, let's go create, you know, an IoT platform. Um, and I think uh, many uh, companies are really trying to find, you know, productivity and, um, and impact the bottom line. I think when I went to Hitachi, what I really appreciated was the double bottom line. Hitachi would talk openly about, um, you know, doing good for the business and doing good for society and the environment. And how could you find, um, you know, societal value and, and environmental value in um, creating value for stakeholders? And that really was something that attracted me to the Hitachi way of thinking and, and outcomes then expanded in our, our thought. Now, did Hitachi really uh, prioritize those? No, it was still hard to get away from the P&L. And I think that's kind of what led me to where I'm at now, which is Turntide, um, which is a much smaller company, but with a lot of the same dynamics where we're trying to take an electric motor, one of the most commodity, you know, technologies out there and through 
you know, Moore's law, we've been able to innovate around how the motor is controlled to make it super efficient. And so now, but we're really trying to take our customers on this journey to sustainable operations. So it's like from an electric, selling you an electric motor to taking you to sustainable operations, which we're trying to, you know, kind of collaboratively define right now because uh, people are, are thinking about sustainability, but it's not yet, you know, I think a, a framework uh, has not completely, um, you know, resolved itself there. So, so really thinking about to our customers, how do you drive that productivity that, that Terry was talking about and Ganit were talking about in the operations of your of your business um, that finances then the and, and helps you lower your carbon impact. So you're really doing good, uh, you know, uh, while you're while you're powering your business productivity with the, with this technology. Yeah, that's a great point, Brad and um, Gunit. We have also spoken about this outcome concept, right? How do you even define what the outcome is that I would want to sell and then manage that outcome? Uh, any thoughts from you? Hire Kearney? No, I'm kidding. I'm not doing an advertisement <laughs> for you. But no, I think on a serious note, I think we uh, the value pools that we've seen. Uh, Brad said it well. I'm Brad. I mean, I was fascinated when he joined Turntide because 50% of the world's energy consumption is rotating equipment motors. I didn't know that. I thought yeah, it was all about the crazy. solar and the wind, but. <laughs> yeah, it's more of the demand side. It's crazy, uh, but yeah, yeah, they can have a huge impact. Four, we could add four Amazon rainforests if we just upgrade the electric motors in North America. It's it's uh, it's crazy. Yeah, I think the two value pools to answer your question, uh, and you know, I love to get Terry opinion is unplanned downtime and sustainability mm -hmm. and decarbonization. I think that's the two big ones at least we see right now. And you know what we're doing is trying to create offers around right. So in unplanned downtime. Of course, IoT has a critical part to play from a tech perspective, from an AI perspective, from an ML perspective. But you know, we're adding on top of that uptime guarantees, we're adding outcome guarantees to say, hey, if you can run the asset certain productivity. And you know, one of my favorite examples is this company which goes to the mines and says, hey, I'll give you zero unplanned downtime, mm -hmm. and between the two PMs. But if I happen to have a downtime, I'll cover the cost of repair. And you know, we underwrite the risk of covering the cost of repair. So. Uh, Terry, I'd love to get your opinion, but I think the uptime and the decarb sides is really where we're creating these unique outcomes to go you know, get that. I think that um, where I've seen, you know, a lot of machinery businesses have, have uh, offered outcome based agreements, but the problem pre IOT was the, the risk of those agreements was you never knew how the customer was operating the equipment um, had to, you know, make some assumptions and then you, you incorporated those risks, what you thought were risks into the contracts. Sometimes you, they were well written, sometimes they weren't. I think where IoT has really changed it is it's taken away a lot of that risk because the machinery is connected. You know how it's run. You know if there's being, you know, PM preventive maintenance being implemented. And so it really makes the that that outcome based service a more commercial viable, yeah. not only for the, the offer, but also for the for the, the the user of it, and it's that's that's transforming a lot of businesses that didn't have necessarily that as a business model. Now they're being able to offer it. Yeah, I, if I could build on what Terry said, I because I think um, what it's also allowing us to do is kind of look at outcomes more broadly. We learn a lot now that the machines are connected, and we can think there's the the first order value that's created through the zero one plan downtime. But now we're starting to understand as we think about the, the carbon emissions from different types of machinery at, at different conditions in their maintenance, um, you can start to look at the impacts of maintenance uh, spend. You could optimize it for just zero unplanned downtime. You could also try to find that nice balance between you know, unplanned downtime and uh, emissions so that you could find that it. it may not be down, but it could be polluting more or it could be drawing more you know, power than it than it needs to, and companies now at least have the power to do something about that if they're if they value that. And I think that what we're finding is a lot more you know consumer sentiment is is pushing companies to to make those kind of you know carbon neutral pledges and and um, and look for opportunities for that. I think the same technologies that we're investing in that get, that got us into productivity plays. It's the, it's it's un, it's really revealing new opportunities for um uh for carbon savings too it's uh it's, it's really interesting that's fascinating to build on that quickly Disha. i know uh, i'm sure you want another question answered but this is fascinating right so, 
we three we actually see three risks building on what Jay and Brad said. We see strategic risks number one in any you know of these changes. Of course, we see tech and implementation risks, and we see financial risks. Right. And Terry said it really well, the tech and uh, implementation risk is pretty much minimized with IoT because you actually know what's going on with the machine. You know what, you know, the possibility and predictability of when it will fail. Uh, it's also interesting to see the banking and the insurance world. I mean, fully owned insurance subsidiary, who knew insurance would ever require an IoT company uh, that they're actually getting into managing the financial risk for you. So the industrial companies don't need to worry about the complex financial risks. Of course, then we have to take strategic risks or, you know, OEMs and service providers have to take some strategic risks to take the building. So it's very fascinating how the tech and implementation risks are so minimal now because of all the work we've done in the five to seven years leading to the tech to get here. Right? So let's go a little bit deep on all those three risks. Uh, tech risk, yes, it's minimal with all the investments, but it also comes with added issues with endpoint security and cybersecurity. Terry spoke about how are companies thinking about managing that risk? Terry, maybe I'll start with you. Well, I think I, I, I'm really passionate about this part of the business. Um, is that every company should have two things. They should have a data management strategy, which includes, you know, privacy. And, and then you need to have a cybersecurity um, strategy. And you need to have market facing. You need to have what we called connected product data principles. and uh, connected product security principles. And those were documents that we developed and they were market facing. And those were commitments to customers of how we were going to protect their data, how they were going to protect their products. And then what we did was once we took that market facing commitment promise to customers, we cascaded those back into the organization and wrote, you know, you know, technical, organizational, job description, policies that would be implemented to deliver on that commitment. Um, it is data and security is a brand commitment and any company that doesn't believe it. You just have to look at the, you know, some of the things that hit the press rate lately, or if you go back the last 5 years, every single company that's had a breach. Or security issue has lost market cap. It's a huge issue and that should be foundational to anybody's digital strategy. I'll get up my soapbox. <laughs> it's a good soapbox. Brad, anything to add to that? I'm sorry, did you call on me, Vidisha? Yes. Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, I would just say there's a lot for companies like Caterpillar, for GE, for Hitachi, for the big companies, um, they can afford, you know, the talent to, to, and, and to really leverage this technology and do the things that Terry's talking about. I think there's a whole set of manufacturers out there that are that are um, not in a position to make those same kinds of investments and access that same technology. So I think what we have to do is look at at underlying uh, vendors of the technology need to be partners in this and really need to um, to bring uh, don't bring the problems of integrating IoT into your you know your current products. Bring solutions that are intended. Uh, and fit for purpose for for developing connected products. And so, you know, an example is uh, that I, I'll use what I'm doing now with this electric motor is, you know, we embed the the IoT platform into the motor. The motor itself is a software defined motor, but when it goes mm -hmm. into a machine, you know, it it then becomes an enabler of a connected machine. I think it's incumbent upon us as a vendor of that technology when we OEM the motor into somebody else's product that we bring that capability you know, uh, not bring them a set of new problems <laughs> that they have to go solve. At least that's our point of view on it. And I think other vendors, that's really where where the, where the software and hardware vendors in this space really need to uh, to step up, I think. Yeah, and one Can of the I ask you a question, Brad? Go ahead, Terry. Brad, do you think that's, that it behooves the, uh, the OEM that's going to integrate your motor, though, to have the technical business capabilities to know what to even ask you for? I don't. I really don't think. I mean, over time, it'll become like everything else, where you know that that knowledge has has now made it out in general practice in IT departments. But I don't think it's there yet. And so I think it's our responsibility to, if we're if we're thinking uh, as a vendor in terms of outcomes, we should be we should be educating in the process, and we should be bringing 
um, technology and techniques and approaches that you know help you know if I'm thinking at the lower end of the market of OEMs help those companies really progress their strategy in the space with the lowest risk possible and and, and view us as a trusted partner in that uh, that's that's the philosophy we take in this. In that context, Brad, when you speak with like traditional hardware companies or industrial companies, there is a bit of upfront investment that's required uh, on technology side. There is a different way of selling and operating if you're doing selling as a service versus a traditional product. What is that mindset shift that's needed for these traditional companies to even adopt and uh, think different versus taking a cost view of there's a huge upfront investment, there are uncertainties, how do I manage it? Well, I, I'll just give a quick example. I'm looking at Burns' question. You know, I think that's where you're yes. getting it from. Um, yeah, I think we, we, at GE, right, the the investment, it wasn't about, you know, uh, IoT, as I said. It was really about um, reducing the downtime or improving the productivity around the managed maintenance services business. And we we ran a whole lot of small projects that like a portfolio approach of small projects, each with a hard ROI or a, a thesis around a hard ROI. And that would be the the driver for making the investments. It wasn't, and, and believe me at that time too, we were doing it on aircraft engines and everything else. Every new sensor we wanted to add or anything like that, it, it was extremely well analyzed because uh, the weight penalties and the cost penalties and all of that, you, you know, it was not a technology first. Uh, it was really a data driven exercise and, and we could then use data to then show how we could go say, deliver an ROI. And then that, that really enabled us to, um, to scale. So it was, even though GE kind of scaled with yep. themes fast from the outside, it was in the, in the first three years, very project by project based. Um, but it ended up, you know, in the first three years, delivering a half a billion dollars of, of margin to General Electric through, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it was probably 200 projects that we did across aviation and, and power generation at the time. Yeah, Gunit, you, you also spoke about this uh, uh, concept of ecosystem orchestration of sorts, right? Insurance, finance, technology, all coming together to manage that risk. How does it work? Yep. That's a really good question. I think it piggybacks on what Brad said in Burns' question. So I'll give you a practical example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Trump is a big brand, right? They said. I think I know where you're going to, and it, with Brad, I think um, as you're starting to bundle all of these things and services together now for a customer, um, what I've seen is successful companies have started retraining their salespeople. So instead of being very product focused, Mm -hmm. and understanding the specs, you know, the, the performance characteristics of it is they have to start learning more about their customer processes because they're connected and they're changing their process. They need to understand their customers, uh, you know, their whole value stream. Um, one of the things that we always talk about with salespeople was if you don't understand at least the top three revenue and top three costs of your customer's P&L, to, you don't know enough about their business, right? So it, it's changing the, you know, the mindset of the sales force. The second thing that I've seen is, and there's a lot of data and it's globally, is to change the sales people's uh, mentality to become what they call the challenger sales approach, where they don't come in there just a pure relationship, but they go in there and they start challenging customers operation, not in a bad way, but really challenging them. So, and then helping them make more money. And that's a big mind shift on the sales sales side with IoT. Yeah. You said it really well. And I hope you guys can hear me now, but I think that's exactly where I was going. And I, I think very important is for them to understand it's a long-term relationship with a lot of sales coming. And, you know, IoT hardware becomes, you know, kind of immaterial at that point because it's the first thing you get. But, you know, the next, you know, this machine will last for 20 years. And the worst thing a sales guy could have done previously is sold a machine, waited for 10, 20 years and try and go back and sell a machine again. Right? Yeah. Or go back and fix a problem when there is a problem where you're not in an excited frame of mind. But the continuous uh, you know, customer success. In fact, for the first time in industrial, we see customers setting up customer success teams. 
I mean, that's huge, I think, in my mind. The whole concept of customer success and you know having a share in the customer success and driving the sales behavior accordingly is exactly yeah. kind of what, what we need. And having been through a number of transformations of these sales forces, uh, GE and at Hitachi, and it's like that's it's harder than the technology for sure. And I think it what it does is it brings in. Yeah, if I was going to give advice to someone who's maybe starting this journey, I would say you know we look to bring in enterprise software salespeople um, and mix them with industrial salespeople. Now you can imagine how hard that is, right? But the challenger sales methodology, solution selling, all of that was pretty, I was at SAP prior to GE, like that was all, that's how you go sell, you know, enterprise software. So those kind of people, they naturally understand that process and customer success and, and all that comes with it. They don't understand industrial though. So then you bring them into your company and that's when the fun begins. And, uh, you know, and the industrial side, um, you know, needs to gain that experience. So we at, at GE, we, we really focused on what we talked about as digital industrial as a cultural change. We said, you know, if you come from the quote unquote digital side, this enterprise software side, you know, you don't have the right DNA for, for General Electric, but if you come up 35 years from the, you know, manufacturing side, you don't have it either. The new DNA of the leader, the future leader at GE was somebody who blurred the lines between those areas. And that's a really, I think at this phase, you know, probably, you know, in, in a few years, you'll have kind of digital industrial native, you know, kind of people out there that have come up through this. But, at, you know, at this stage, you have to create that. And that's a really challenging, uh, really challenging thing to Play, do. To ask you a question though, Brad, on that, there is um, low hanging fruit or I call fruit on the ground, right? You could do, <laughs> You could do aftermarket sales bundles, which kind of puts together uh, the industrial know-how because you know people have been selling aftermarket for a while in industrial, but takes it to a slightly new level because you can go guarantee outcome, you can go guarantee yeah. output. Do you think there's a happy medium to start without solving that big problem? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think what I what I've seen work is we shift the conversation about what we're selling from products to uh, offers and we would talk about whole offers and I got this idea from Todd Hewlin and, and Jeff Moore if you know crossing the chasm but um, they work closely with us uh, in a number of cases but uh, but if you think about a whole offer you think about an outcome that you're trying to drive and then you think about what are you, what's your hardware what's your software what's partner hardware what's partner software what are the services that all needs to come together to deliver that outcome for your customer and then you work out the complexities of you know, revenue recognition, which all of the complexities turned out to be in much more internal than external with partners as we started to go down this path. And, but you start to see where the silos of the organization are going to, are going to probably, you know, fight against you delivering this. And you can solve for that ahead of time versus forcing your sales force to solve for it in the field in front of a customer in order to get a deal. That's, that was one, you know, pragmatic approach that, um, that you know work for us. Focus on offers, and then figure out how to go take those to market, go pilot that, and then start to scale that. There's also a change in the way you engage with your customers. It's more upfront value creation discussion versus, hey, you have a problem. This is a solution I have. And in that context, we've seen a lot of ecosystem partnerships. So companies, traditional industrial giants, or uh, companies, digital natives like Relay or Turntide all coming together to partner to deliver the outcome. So do you see, Guneet, that ecosystem partnership dynamic growing and where do you see the industry growing in that space? I firmly believe one plus one has to be more than three <laughs> for this to work, right? So I think it's how do you bring the different parties? I mean, for example, right now, I've just learned a lot uh, from Terry and Brad, right? And, you know, Terry brings that background of the industrial, Brad also brings that background of digital and, you know, industrial. I can absolutely bring a very unique perspective on how insurance and financing and business models will evolve in this IoT. And, you know, the three of us could solve a problem probably better than one of us individually. So I think absolutely ecosystems is the way to go. And I'll tell you, we're on the beautiful soapbox of data privacy and data security, which is uh, wild, wild west, honestly, because we work with the mid market and nobody's even thinking on those lines. So I think. There are problems which only ecosystems can solve, and we firmly believe that's that's probably the way to go. Right? Yeah, and it's a bit challenging to build that ecosystem partner, especially if you are like a large conglomerate kind of a business, because uh, 
you engage them, but it eventually ends up being more of a um, selling products together, going, doing go to market together versus actually co-creating a solution. It's a different way of engaging uh, your partnership. So how do you engage with your clients to build that co-creation mindset? Um, I can go first in order to get others' perspective. I think from our perspective, we've uh, pivoted our business model to be gain share, first of all. So, you know, one way to solve it, I'm not saying that's the only way to solve it, but, you know, we've taken a gain share approach where if our vendors and our partners are successful, we kind of get a certain percentage and we pass that percentage to all the partners from the hardware and software perspective. Of course, margin profiles are different. It's it's not super straightforward, but it's still doable. <laughs> it's still doable because, you know, you're sharing value when everybody sees value versus theoretically sharing value with an ROI calculator in the upfront, which nobody believes, you know, but they don't see it. But I don't know that's one way we've solved it. I'd love to see other ideas. Terry, what do you think? Oh, I, I think, Venetia, you're, you're hitting on one of the questions in here is organizationally, how do you go to market? Is that, is that in response to the question we've got in the Q&A? Yes, I'm just trying to manage some of the Q&A with my questions too, but yes, yeah, it's related. Okay. No, I think that that's, that's something that, you know, every organization that I've seen and, and work with struggles with. Um, I think a lot of companies early on with IoT adoption went and created a, you know, a fast, you know, go fast, fail fast, fail forward, and created a digital customer facing organization. And I think almost every single one of them has pulled back on that and said, because customers don't want digital. Yeah. They want, you know, they want outcomes. And so that's really where you need to have the traditional sales folks there. Again, changing their thought process around process, but having digital be part of what they offer and offering them. I think you brought that up as a, you know, the, the customer support groups, right? So, and teams that can support that traditional market facing organization with digital, with uh, insurance, with, you know, hardware and software. But try to keep it simple for the customers and who they need to talk to and not create this channel conflict mess in go to market. So you got to keep it simple for your customer and then manage the complexity inside the organization. Yeah, I and saw the same thing. Terry, Terry saw the same progression, you know, from a digital <clears throat> sales force to he really it, it feels like you have to take the the existing sales force in a in a traditional business, move them towards consultative selling. So kind of get them out of the product mindset, move them toward, but it's the same people or a lot of the same people, you know, the typical sales journey, not everybody can make that transition, but a, a lot of people can. And I think you have to, you kind of have to train the core sales team who has the relationships with your customers, who has access to the buying centers, um, but train them how to do more of a consultative sell versus the speeds and feeds. Here's the you know, the feature set that we have. And then you have to augment them with overlay sales capabilities around some of the digital technologies. So just like you have a pre-sales person who comes in and can talk, you know, details around the hardware product or the traditional product, you're gonna need to augment that with some people who understand, you know, the, the, techno the IT technology or the digital technology side, but they're support players. They're not, they're not the front, you know, that what the enterprise software piece is the interesting piece is like those are the people who understand consultative selling so you need to mix some of those people some of that dna into your organization but they don't understand how to go sell you know your your core product line so that's therein lies i think the the art of the transformation is how you know you don't want to rotate and just go hire a whole enterprise software sales team but you do want to bring some of that that expertise into your organization and there's also a change in the buying centers of who are you speaking with. So how have you seen that evolve? I think Brad, you went on <laughs> good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Venetia. It was I'm at home, and so I got my my daughter came in and interrupted. <laughs> so can you ask the question again? <laughs> yeah, you you hit on the point of buying centers, right? Uh, so one is the change in how you sell and how you engage your customers, but the buying centers have also changed. If you look at from a buyer standpoint, so what shift have you seen and who are we speaking with now for these topics versus what we did three or four years back? 
Yeah, I think it's industry specific, right? But a lot of times it shifts from VPs of operations into more C-level conversations. Oftentimes even CFOs are engaged. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we're starting to see, uh, you know, we're going to market in commercial real estate is one area and we're getting into vehicle electrification and things of that nature or non-passenger vehicle electrification. Mm -hmm. And we're finding, you know, where we used to engage with facilities managers and operations people. Now, if we go out and go in with a discussion around the kind of um, cost savings that we can drive across this whole portfolio of, of buildings and the, the, the sustainable operations that you have or the carbon, how it contributes to your carbon neutral strategy, we get a much higher level of discussion up into the C-suite and not all the sales force isn't always accustomed to how having those kinds of conversations. And so that that's a different, that's where some of these enterprise software people help because that's where they tend to try to sell all the time. So, you, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's the other hard part of these buying centers. There's not a clear buyer for some of these outcomes that you're bringing to market. There's like several and you have, it makes your sales cycle more complicated. Yeah, and you need to explain your value proposition. So Terry, when you were uh, more on the Caterpillar side, engaging with the, the provider, so to say, what's your expectation as, uh, uh, as an enterprise customer trying to engage technology companies and providers in the space? What do you expect from them? In, in terms of buying from or selling? Yes. From? Buying. buying. From? Um, I think er, early on, um, and I think it still exists, it, although it's, it's getting better, was there was a lot of hype. Um, and um, the frustration was, and this is why you ended up with a lot of, you know, uh, pilots and purgatory, right? Is kept mm -hmm. trying it out was there was, there was a lot of stuff that just didn't work. Yep. Um, and on the sales side, you know, they weren't very technical or, you know, they didn't understand it. So I think that that was, that was a frustration was over in the IOT space, especially it was over promising and under delivering. Um, and then. I think as things have moved forward is, is, you know, on the buying side was always this concern with vendor lock in. The technology moves so quickly, right? And being able to unplug and plug in technologies was always something that um, we were evaluating. And I think successful companies have, um, whether it's utilities or whether, you know, it's, it, it's major OEMs, is they pick a few strategic partners. And they say, I'm going to go with this technology and then everything else is reevaluated and you're always looking at, you know, to, to straight relevant. And your whole ecosystem was what asking every year, what should we throw off the bus and adopt a new technology? Um, so I think Vidish, I would like to talk about on the sales side, though, one sure. thing that is as as people are moving forward was a lesson learned was oftentimes we talked about it before was you're, you're moving into these new services, which tends to be a, a subscription model, mm -hmm. call it as it is a recurring yep. revenue. And a lot of times when you're, you've got the traditional purchasing person looking at the subscriptions and they're going, why in the world am I doing this? And then at the end of the year, they just, you know, put a check mark through it and it's done. Is one of the things that I've seen companies be successful on it, going back to these customer success teams is actually going through whatever the frequency is and depends on the size of the customer is having regular updates on reviewing the financial returns. Mm -hmm. So in industrial space, the people are going to get the biggest benefit of the operational folks. And then sitting down with them and saying, okay, we helped you save X amount of money. We helped you avoid these kind of accidents. And then formally writing it down, and so that they can go back to the purchasing department and say, hey, this is helping me run the, the plant or my operation so that the purchasing po people don't, you know, wipe through and, and turn off the contract. So it's really helping the internal people that benefit it sell the benefit of your product. And that's a, that's a huge uh, mind shift change for the sales folks. Yeah, and then that's for well. the product folks yeah. as well, because they have to build features into the product that enables the sales team to have that data so that they can go back and show those those outcomes for sure. And but also it's a mindset of you can actually go back and keep developing value, which is mm -hmm. what a lot of industrial roles, yeah. because you, know, you build a product which is 
will stay in the field for 20 years. So you build a product with all the feature functionality in the hardware world. So that's not the case in software. So you keep evolving and adding value. And it's fascinating to see what you two are saying because you know, two years ago, I could guarantee if we were having this panel, we would talk about technology and we'd talk about us, is there ROI, is there proof points? Uh, and you know, I think the market's mature now to see the proof points and the value in tech. But now everybody is really um, figuring out what the monetization models is. And like Terry said, is it subscription? Is it CapEx? How do the finance processes change to actually approve that subscription <laughs> right every year? Uh, but at the same time, the operations guys need to see the value for them to go fight with their finance teams to say, hey, I see value in this. You know, you're going to approve a subscription, but you're going to save money on the other side. And uh, Brad, you're right. The amount of conversations we have with CFOs has significantly increased in the last 12 months. You know, the finance and the CFO teams are actively getting engaged uh, to kind of figure out, you know, where we go from this. And I think this concept of continuous value, be it on the customer success side, but also be it on the technology side, because, you know, AI keeps evolving, as you all know, you know, we get an event, supervised learning gets even better. So the concept of continuous value is is something which has to be really yeah. not used to. And I don't want, I know probably you have one more question for Sudisha, but I just, there's a point I think maybe the listeners might like is think about also, it's a new digital channel. So what we found is as we went down this journey at GE or at Hitachi is you opened up this digital channel for parts. And so you could push, you, you know, because the, the products were connected, you could actually open up new channels to your customer and, and have higher margin higher, you know, value through adding on new ways for them to interact with your parts business or other aspects of your business. And, and that's, that's why this is so interesting, but also why it's so complicated, you know, because you just imagine all the different parts of the organization that have to orchestrate to take advantage of that. Yeah, and Brad, you've spoken about that mindset shift. You've spoken about the operational changes of how you run the business. What about the shift in the capabilities and skills that how do you think about expanding that with the new technologies coming in? Hey, I think Terry had something to say. Maybe we'll let her take that one first. Well, I think that's an excellent question. Vadish, I was going to say in building on what Ganit said earlier was that, you know, if you have a good strategy and incorporates three things, it's, it's people, process and tools slash technology, right? A few years ago, everybody was running around talking about technology. But as we've evolved in, in, you know, strategy implementation is if, if you don't take into consideration people and process, it will fail. And, and that, that has to be, so I think that that going back to your, your question right now is that th those have those three legs of the stool have to be in place for a robust strategy and execution for excellence. Yeah. And it's a, this capability building is across every part of the business and that's. That's why I think these transformations are different from maybe some of the transformations that companies have gone through in the past is um, you're, you're seeing new business models arise. You see, you know, impacts to, we talked about sales a lot here, you know, to finance and how they, how they even look at the returns on investment, even going through the J curve as you shift from <laughs> to, to recurring revenue is a big barrier for a lot of finance organizations to get their heads around and sign off on. Um, and then you have all the, the technology uh, capabilities. So it's not, um, it's, it's the most complicated thing I've ever experienced in my career, which is why I, I love being in this space. I'd say this transformation, this little gray patch is from GE <laughs> and this is from Hitachi. <laughs> so, and, and the rest is from turn tide, right? So that's so <laughs> just turn tide. We'll see, maybe I'll be all gray in a year. <laughs> Yeah. One thing to add to what you said, Brad, just on, on my note is, yes, it's a challenge on capital and yes, it's a challenge on that swallowing the fish of the J curve. But if you think of the flip side, which I didn't know till two years ago, uh, the banks and the insurance companies and the markets are struggling to deploy capital because they're a negative interest rate in, you know, specifically Europe. So I think the only, I guess, uh, plug there is, Whenever tech companies and you know industrial companies run into that challenge, they should look at other people who can solve the financial challenge, because you know any percentage ROI is higher than a negative percentage interest. Higher. Like you know we've been setting up shell companies, special purpose vehicles to buy equipment and create that as a service revenue model. So just just think outside your company. I think is the message, and see that other people who can help you with that financial challenge. Because on the flip side, people want to solve the financial challenge, and they can't find problems to solve. Right? 
which is interesting. Do you see a lot of partnerships in this space with banks, financial institutions, institutions actively investing here? There is starting to happen with each. I think specifically more in Europe, which is interesting. Also because a lot of the American companies have their own capital. You know, Caterpillar, GE, everybody, Siemens, they had their own, you know, GE capital arm. Uh, whereas Europe does not, but we see a lot of you know the Deutsche banks of the world, uh, you know other insurance companies all starting. There's a lot of smaller funds, 50, 100 million, very very focused on just the private equity side of things, focused on you know transforming the capex to opex. So I see it's very early days, but it's starting. A lot of people are starting to get there. Got it. Yeah, I'm going to uh, shift the conversation a little bit towards opportunities. We spoke about a lot of challenges. What needs to be done? As you think ahead of the next two to three years with the advancement and technology changes in mindset, uh, if there's one thing that each of you would share with the, the industrial giants or the high tech companies on what is that one change you should do today to make the most of this future? Brad, let's start with you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> What's the one thing, the one thing that solves all of this? <laughs> um, wow. I. I don't know that I can. I'm smart enough to know uh, the answer to that one, one thing. But I would say, um, you know, there's there's a lot of advice out there around. I, I see questions too in the in the channel around, you know, digital business units and how to think about all of that. I'd say, um, you know, cross functional teams that are carved off and given an opportunity to go. Uh, pragmatically pilot offers is that's how how I would always start now having gone through some of these these situations and protecting those teams not letting them go off and become their own ivory tower you know you don't want them to go geek out on the technology you want them to be a mix of your your people who have been around your business for a long time some new talent coming in you don't want it to be all about the technology you want it to be about Focusing on getting a business off the ground, um, you want it. You want to find that balance of allowing it to leverage the relationships that your firm has with current customers and the install access to the install base, but at the same time not getting too uh, bogged down by the larger uh, business, um, uh, both in terms of you know the momentum of that business and how the returns on this little startup are not going to be as good. It's the whole zone. <coughs> Zone management way of thinking, I think, is I think if you if I could offer one piece of advice, I think that maybe is the best piece of advice to, to start thinking about around this is is carve off these these incubation teams and then as they grow, start to integrate them back into your larger business. Gunit, anything to add? I'm sure I'd take a similar but different approach. <laughs> I'd say uh, I like Brad's idea of you know building up. I think start from the value is what I would say, number one, because I think without that, and I'm a big fan of micro goals and just basically say, hey, where's the value and what's the micro goal and start proving it for yourself because, you know, lots of questions show it's still very theoretical and you're kind of leading the charge in the business model side. The technology is not that theoretical anymore. We've proven that, but the business models are very, very theoretical. So I'd say start from the value and uh, like Brad said, but like start having micro goals and whether it's a new team or an old team or just get it done. And when you meet the first micro goal, then plan the next one. And then I think hopefully, you know, you have your own strategy because there is no predefined uh, playbook yet. <laughs> Everybody <think. laughs> That's why we are having these conversations to engage. <laughs> Terry, I'll let you have the last word on this. I think I'm going to align with the, what uh, Ganit and Brad both said was, I think, you know, trust your people, engage your people of your organization. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to me how many ideas come up from the grassroots level. Um, good ideas, people that know the customer problems, know the organizational problems, and then figure out a way to, you know, do an inter, you know, it, it, not to use another buzzword, but entrepreneurs, right? And let them go at it and then have a way to foster it and grow it. And um, it's really exciting, you know, to see what happens if you put in a good place to engage your, your people because they're, they're truly the experts and you've got, there's a lot more experts, I think, in a company than what maybe sometimes give the, the organization credit for. Yeah, maybe we can have a lot more dialogues because you learn a lot when you engage with four people on the call talking about this topic. 
Uh, Terry, Gunith, and Brad, thanks for the time today. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of tons of questions out there on IoT and how do we engage, but it was a great starting point uh, to get your thoughts. But I'm going to hand it over to you to close it out. Thank you, Vidisha. Wow, that was an exciting discussion. Well, my biggest takeaway is IoT is here to help and it's going to move the needle on operational efficiencies, which are real and tangible. Thank you, Terry. You know, your statement on mind shifts from product to customer processes and then, you know, allowing them to make more money, I couldn't agree more with you. I feel this really has positive implications and not just IoT and business models, but beyond that, be it sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Gunit, thanks to you too. You know, your point on resilient and predictable revenue models, I'm sure that's gonna be music to the Wall Street. And it's really a creative, so it's not just some kind of a fancy, you know, utopian thing that we are trying to do. Lastly, Brad, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by the potential for business model innovation that you talk about. I think it'll be the key for how IoT shapes our world, not just today, next five years, but the next couple of decades, I'd say. And Vidisha, thanks for engaging our experts in such a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And folks, um, all the participants, as we enter summer, we'll be on a little bit of a hiatus so everybody can enjoy summer. And we'll be back in fall on topics on cybersecurity, rise of SPACs, especially in the tech space. And in the meantime, look out for a summary um, for today's webinar next week. Again, thank you, everyone, uh, and have a wonderful uh, week ahead of you.